Yo, what's up, guys? We're back for another week of breakdown and predictions. We got a big week. We got a UFC pay per view, UFC 297 grudge match going on in the main event with Sean Strickland and Drikas Duplessis. And I'm pretty confident about this card, man. I feel like I have a good read on several fights. I'm feeling confident on the bets that I have already put on uh, Patreon that I bet already. So feeling good this week, feeling like we're going to make some money. We're coming off a profitable week last week on the Patreon where we did make a little bit over a unit profit. And I'm going to be trying to do that every week, man. That's my goal this year. I want to win every week, whether I'm not going to win every event, but if I win every week betting wise, then there's no reason why I can't win, you know, 100, 200 units and have a fantastic year because I bet on a lot of different promotions outside the UFC and things like that. So as long as I be, as long as I'm positive, I'm going to be happy about it. You know, sometimes I feel like I kind of, want to put more bets on to make more money and at the end of the day you know slow and steady for me is what wins the race in my eyes so that's what i'm gonna keep doing and um anyone else wants to join over there patreon.com slash emory prediction guru go sign up doing a free trial through january and i think a few people got confused because patreon did add this um new feature where a lot of people signed up for the um free um free patreon member they like they didn't um sign up for a tier or a free trial. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put all the content out to all members. So people that have the free, that sign up for the free um, package, you don't have to change or anything. I'm just going to send it out to all you guys. But then at the end of January, I'm going to stop sending it out to everybody and go back to the particular tier. So you're going to have to sign up if you want to stick around and get that good content. So you're going to be able to get it for now. Um, that way and you don't really got to worry about it because I had a quite a few people hit me up they're kind of confused about that so just going to do it that way and um yeah man besides that hit the like button on this video I got you know one and a half thousand people watching every week pretty much and uh I don't get it I don't, haven't been getting a lot of likes man so everyone that's watching this video you know I should have over a thousand likes let's Everyone that's watching it, hit the like button. It's easy. It's free. Something that really helps the channel. So please, guys, if you're listening right now, hit that like button. Um, help support the channel. Put a comment down below. Let's try to get some more interaction. Let's try to get the impressions out on this on these videos and things like that. I would really appreciate it. So anyone that's watching, hit the like button. Let's try to get as many likes as possible. Let's try to get over 500 likes. That would be incredible, man. I would really, really, really appreciate that. So if you're watching, it's really easy. Just tap that like button. And um, not subscribe, subscribe. I do these videos every week. So definitely stick around and um, check out the channel. Going to be doing more content like I did last week. But let's just get in this first fight of the night right here. Malcolm Gordon taking on Jimmy Flick. And this is a close money line fight here where Malcolm Gordon is the slight favorite over, over Jimmy Flick in this fight. And you look at these guys, they're kind of glass cannons, right? Like... I think Jimmy Flick's been finished six times. Malcolm Gordon's been finished seven times. So they've both been finished quite a few times. And it seems like they either can get that win inside the distance or they get finished. Both of them are kind of like that. It's usually not like that for flyweight. But these guys seem like killer be killed type of fighters. Um, and they got similar styles in the sense of that they're both grapplers. I see people saying that Malcolm Gordon is going to go out there and get the knockout on the feet or easily outstrike Jimmy Flick. And I, I just don't see that. I mean, Malcolm Gordon is the much faster guy, the more athletic guy. And I would say he probably has the ability if he had the composure to stick on the outside, use leg kicks, use his straight punches and maybe be effective. But he's so afraid of being hit and he just has such limited durability that he just bum rushes guys with their strikes to get into the clinch is super wild and I just feel like it's going to turn into a grappling match because of that I mean Jimmy Flake the guy doesn't really throw many punches out there he kind of tries to just stay showed up defensively sound and he has some decent kicks um as weird as it sounds I mean he's been knocked out six times uh Gordon's been knocked out five but I still think Flick is the more durable and tougher guy. Like Jimmy Flick, usually when he gets knocked out, it's because I think he kind of quits a little bit in the fight and he'll pull guard after he can't really get his grappling going and just kind of let guys pound him out. It seems like he does that sometimes and he'll check out of the fight. But 
for Malcolm Gordon, he also has that quit in him. But I feel like if you hit him clean, you, he'll get knocked out or he'll get hurt a lot more easily than Jimmy Flick will. So honestly, I think Jimmy Flick is the more durable guy. But with Jimmy Flick, I mean, we got a guy that's a pure grappler. He's a grinder. He's someone that has kind of subpar wrestling, but really, really good top control. He could um, float from position to position really well. He chains submissions together and has exceptional grappling cardio. And usually he's really good at not losing position. He's not going to be silly and make mistakes. And Malcolm Gordon, he's one of these guys where I think even if he gets on top of Jimmy Flick, I don't necessarily feel like he has the top game that gives Jimmy Flick issues. Like I was saying just now, you know, the guys that have been able to Jimmy finish Jimmy Flick, they'll posture up, they throw heavy ground and pound, and they can get him out of there that way. But Malcolm Gordon, he doesn't really like to posture and throw a lot of ground and pound. He likes to stay really heavy on top and use his top pressure, his head pressure, his things like that to try to open up passing situations where he could take the back. And then he has fast back takes. He has pretty good rear naked chokes. But... I feel like Gordon can get backed up and taken down in this fight. And I think that even if he gets on top, he could potentially lose position or Flick could create a scramble and then end up wrestling him to the ground. So I just have more faith in Jimmy Flick keeping that position on top, controlling. And I think that he has the better cardio and just the more toughness overall. So I feel like Jimmy Flick is going to kind of wear on Malcolm Gordon and then submit him. I mean, there's a possibility that either of these guys could get hit once and knocked out, I guess. I think it's much more likely that it would be Malcolm Gordon that gets knocked out off just like a fluke shot. But Jimmy Flick doesn't have that power, so I just don't see that happening. I think it's going to be a grappling match, like I said. And I feel like Jimmy Flick's going to get the job done in this one. So give me Jimmy Flick. I'll say he wins via third-round submission. And the second fight of the night, we got Priscilla Zombie Girl Cachoeira taking on Jasmine Jazuda Vicious. And don't have a real technical breakdown for this one or anything, but definitely leaning towards uh, Jazuda Vicious. She's minus 400, so at that line, I definitely wouldn't say to go run to the betting window on her. I think that that line's way too wide, personally. But I feel like she's going to get the job done. I mean, you look at stylistically... What type of fighters have given Priscilla Cachoeira the most issues? And it's all been grapplers. And that's exactly what she's getting into Zuda Vicious. You look at Priscilla's last fight with Miranda Maverick. She got submitted. She got submitted by Jillian Robertson. She got finished on the ground against Valentina. So historically, she's really struggled with girls that can take her down, that can get in dominant positions. And she tends to give up the finishes. Um, but with Zuda Vicious... We got a tall grappler, which I think that helps in this fight because she's going to be able to get a hold of Priscilla Cachoeira, potentially use her kicks, back her up, and then get her against the cage before she has to kind of engage in that pocket battle. And um, that's where Cachoeira is really the most dangerous and really her only path to victory in most of these fights. She has to get these girls to get in the pocket with her where she can wing bombs and if you brawl with her, she has crazy knockout power. I mean, Ariane Lipsky, a girl that is doing really good right now, learned that the hard way with Priscilla. She went in there, she brawled with her, got clipped, got put down, got knocked out. So that's not what you want to do. If you want to sit in there and go punch for punch, for punch with Cachoeira, she can eat all your shots and she probably will end up knocking you out. But if you fight smart, you use your distance control, you take her down, I don't see how... Jujuda Vicious loses this fight. I think if she can implement the wrestling, she's going to have a huge advantage when she gets on top. She's not going to give up position. She should be able to get the takedowns pretty easily. I'm not worried about Jujuda Vicious being someone that gets tired and Cachoeira could take advantage of that, which she's done against certain opponents. Jujuda Vicious usually has really good cardio. And the only downfall with Jujuda Vicious is she takes a lot of shots to come inside. And she definitely is tenacious and tough, but she relies on her chin and eventually that could be her downfall and she could get knocked out. But I just feel like that's not as likely as her going out here and dominating this fight on the ground. So personally, I feel like she's going to be able to get in these dominant positions with her ground and pound and maybe a crucifix or something like that and end the fight in the second or third round. I think she'll wear on Cachoeira 
and then get her out of there on the ground. So give me Jasmine Zudavicius to get the finish inside the distance here. In this next fight, we got Sam Patterson taking on Johan Liness. And this is going to be Sam Patterson's second UFC fight. First fight at 170. He's going to be moving up. His first fight in the UFC was at 155. So I don't know if he felt like he cut too much weight and that attributed to him getting knocked out. But moving up to 170 for this one where he still should be relatively uh, decently sized for the weight class. And he's going to be taking on Johan Liness, who's 1-2 and two so far in the UFC. He was able to get in the UFC through the contender series, the big upset knockout over Justin Berlinson, but they've given him some hard opponents. I mean, you look at the three guys that he's fought, Mike Villot, Darion Weeks, Gabe Green, all three of those guys are pretty good. So he's been tested right off the bat. I think that this fight, he's getting an easier opponent on paper, so we'll see if he can go out there and handle it well. But when you see how these guys match up, I mean, Sam Patterson... He has okay kickboxing. He has good length, which helps him out, and good speed. So he pressures forward. He likes to be in your face but kind of try to use that distance control and throw uh, long punches. He'll mix in some kicks. But I feel like he's a better grappler than he is a striker. He has um pretty good submission game, good front chokes. The issue with that is he doesn't really look to use his grappling offensively. It's all through defensive uh, grappling when opponents shoot it on him that he actually gets on top and he could show his transitions, he could show his front chokes and things like that. I don't think he has the wrestling to really get it to the ground and he never really tries to. And with Johan Liness, we got a guy that's not the greatest fighter in the world, but he's tall and lengthy in his own right. I think he's going to be a lot closer in height and reach than most opponents are in comparison to Sam Patterson when he usually fights them. So ultimately, I think that Liness is going to have a good chance to land on the chin of Patterson. I mean, Patterson stands very upright. He leaves his chin right in the air. I don't like his stance at all, and I think he's just very open to be hit. Johan, he throws these looping punches that I think could be very effective in this fight. And one thing we know about Johan Liness is what he doesn't have in technicality, he brings in power. He has crazy power, one-punch knockout power. So if he can land clean on Patterson, I think he's going to put him to sleep. And I like that Yoan's at TriStar for this fight. He had a full camp there. Previously, being kind of bouncing around gyms, didn't really find his spot. Now he's at one of the best gyms in the world, and I think that could pay dividends here. I don't see Sam Patterson taking him to the ground. If Patterson does get on top of Johan, then Patterson has a good chance to win. Because we saw Johan get submitted quick against Mike Malott. Seems like he's not the greatest on the ground. But I feel like ultimately Patterson kind of reminds me of a Weston Wilson with that tall man defense. And I think that moving up to 170 is not going to be the anecdote for him. I don't think that it was because of the weight cut that he was getting knocked out. I think it's because he was getting hit flush. And moving up in weight, facing bigger guys that hit harder, I don't think that's going to help you in not getting knocked out. So I'm going to go with Liness. I'm going to say he gets the first round KO here. And this next fight, we got a pretty self-explanatory fight to me with Pauliana Viana and Jillian Robertson. We got a fight between a finisher, some girl, and uh, Pauliana. I guess two finishers, really. But Pauliana Viana, all of her wins, which is pretty crazy if you look at her career, all 13 wins are first round finishes. So... She hasn't been able to get you out of there in the first round or get you out of there quick. She usually doesn't get the win, and you could tell why in her style. I mean, on the feet, she's probably the better striker. She's definitely the faster, more dangerous girl with, you know, better technique, but just doesn't really have a lot of rhyme or reason to her striking. She doesn't have good distance control. It's really just kind of wild and low volume. When she gets taken down, she accepts bottom position and she can hunt that arm bar, and if she gets it, then, hey, she's going to beat you probably in the first round. But if you have good heavy top pressure, you can kind of nullify the arm bar. You can hold her down and beat her. And we saw in her last fight, she even got submitted by uh, Yasmin Lucindo. So she also can get submitted. She got submitted by Veronica Macedo as well. And um, with Jillian Robertson, we got a girl that's getting better on the feet, but... She's going to be getting this fight to the ground. I don't think she's going to have any difficulty in doing that. I think she'll be able to hit the single, hit the double, hit a body lock. Um, Viana doesn't really 
have great takedown defense, nor does she really put up much resistance in defending the takedown. So I think that Robertson is going to be able to get it to the ground. And from there, it's just going to be a battle of if Robertson can use her top pressure to eventually open up the submission or win a decision, or if she falls asleep and gets caught in another armbar. Because if you look at her career, she did get caught in an armbar against Myra Bueno Silva. She got caught in an armbar earlier in her career before the UFC and as an amateur. So she's lost three times via an armbar. So to me, that's a little bit of a red flag when you're looking at her facing Apollyana Viana, who the majority of her wins are armbar victories. So I feel like Jillian is definitely the rightful favorite. I feel like she can pressure, get the takedown with ease, get on top. And when you have that style against Jillian, you know that she's going to be able to get the takedown and be on top. It's hard to not think she's going to get the win. And I do think ultimately she's going to get the job done. But just that one wrinkle is throwing me off a little bit. Because if Pollyanna goes in there and catches the arm bar, I wouldn't be shocked. So I'm going with Robertson. And um, I think she could win by decision or submission. Uh, don't really got a solid read on that. But I think she's going to get the job done. If Yana wins, it's going to be a first round arm bar. Um, but I'm going to go with Jillian Robertson. And in this next fight, we got a rematch of two guys, Serhi Sidi. He's taking on Ramon Tavares. We saw this fight in the Contender Series, and in that fight, Sidi dropped Tavares. Fight got called early, so they decided to run it back here. And in this one, I'm going to go with Sidi here. And the reasoning for this is because I went, and the first time they actually fought, I, I, was, I was leaning towards, towards Tavares, Tavares getting the win. He was a... a much, much bigger, bigger underdog, underdog at, at that, that time, time on the contender series, series, I believe. I but after, after watching, watching the first fight, fight you could see that Tavares was, was having success with his style, you know, moving around, uh, pot shotting, and, and using his quickness in his boxing. But CD, it seemed like once he felt the power from Tavares, he knew that he could eat it, and he got a lot of confidence, got on the inside, was able to get his own boxing off. And when he landed clean, he ended up hurting Tavares. And I feel like CD in general, he is the bigger, longer guy, and he also has the better weapons from the outside in terms of the kicks. He can mix it up a little bit more. Tavares definitely has that speed advantage, and he's probably going to be throwing more volume. But I think CD, as long as he doesn't come in here too overconfident in this fight, obviously got a knockout win the last time these guys matched up. He's going to be in Canada in front of his home crowd in this one, UFC debut. So... He just, he just needs, needs to, to stay within himself, himself and stay defensively sound. And even though in the first fight it seemed like he could eat the power of Tavares, he has to still respect it and not run into anything, be, being stupid, being silly. And if he doesn't do that, I think eventually he'll be the guy that can land first, like he did in the first fight, cleaner. And I think he's just going to be a little bit technically better in terms of just defensively sound, throwing the more basic strikes that land a little bit more on the button and I think he'll be able to get Tavares out of there again so that's what I'm leaning a little bit and at this point and I think that CD is going to get the job done I think it's pretty good circumstances for him here I mean the first time they fought on the contender series it was um you know, probably a lot of pressure. He was coming into the United States. Now he's got his contract, and it's still pressure, but he's going to get the fight in front of his home crowd, and there's a lot more things going for him than in the first fight. Tavares is coming off that knockout win, but I think this can be more of a stand-up fight, and I think CD's going to do well. It's boxer versus boxer, and I think CD is going to prove to be just a little bit better like he did in the first fight. So give me Sari CD. I think he'll win in this one once again. And up next, we got a fight between two fan favorites. Uh, should be a fun striking fight here with Sean Woodson and Charles Jourdain. Both these guys, recently, they've been looking fairly good. I mean, Sean Woodson, he just got the victory over um, Dennis Bazookia. He got the easy decision in that one. It really wasn't too competitive of a fight. Obviously, it was him with all his UFC experience taking on UFC debutants. This is going to be a much tougher fight. When he takes on Charles Jourdain, who's coming off two wins in a row, who's coming off a big submission win over Ricardo Hamos. And when you look at how these two guys st match up stylistically, I think it's a very interesting fight because you got Sean Woodson, who anytime you watch him fight in this division, it's going to be an interesting fight because the guy is extremely long, lanky. He has a crazy reach and height for the weight class. So 
he's going to be bringing a different dynamic that most guys don't bring. And he has good long-range striking skills, good boxing, and um, toughness too. I mean, we saw in that Saldana fight, he almost got knocked out cold, came back and almost was able to get the victory. High volume. And in this fight, he's going to have to keep the jab in Jordan's face, try to be technical with combinations, and throw a, a ton of volume and keep the pressure on. Because you've seen Jordan, he likes to kind of explode on guys. And if you stay in his face, you keep a high volume game and you stay technical, you can kind of land on him pretty frequently. Um, but Jordan is a guy that's a, just a missile. He's someone that's going to be coming in with uh, powerful kicks, with powerful hooks, um, with wild techniques, jumping attacks, spinning attacks. So very dangerous, dynamic guy. And then he's also started to implement a good front choke game. I mean, he's hit several of these guillotines on guys re recently. So that's another element that he's been adding. And usually Jordan is a fighter that puts damage on guys as the fights go on and gets better as the fight goes on. Kind of like a, he's not on that level, but like a um, Marlon Chido Vera type of fighter. He has quite a few third round finishes. And I just, when I'm looking at Jordan, I think he could be losing the fight, but I just think he's going to wear on what's, I think he's going to be able to land leg kicks for one. And I think if he lands a clean, big shot, we've seen Woods can get hurt. Um, so if Jordan can close that gap and land a power hook or a power punch, I think he could rock Woodson. And he's not going to let Woodson off the hook like Saldana. He will finish him. And I also think that Jordan, if it does become more of a grappling match, he could get the submission too. So I just think Jordan has more pass to victory. I think he's fought a higher level of competition in the UFC and is probably the more durable guy. So I'm going to predict him to get the job done here in this fight. And closing out the prelims, man, we got an awesome fight. We got Garrett Arnfield taking on Brad Katona. Cool matchup in terms of just stylistically. I think they match up great against each other. And Garrett Arnfield's a guy that he's a bit of an enigma right now because I think he's impressed quite a few people in his last performance in the UFC and even in his performance with David Onama and performances prior to being in the octagon, but he hasn't beaten anyone really at a high level, and he hasn't fought too many higher-level bantamweights, whereas Brad Katona, he is a super veteran at this point. He was in the UFC previously, had some big wins, um, even won the Ultimate Fighter the first time. He beat Kyler Phillips, he beat Bryce Mitchell, went to Brave CF, he became the champion over there. Came back, won the Ultimate Fighter again, and then beat Cody Gibson in his last fight to claim that Ultimate Fighter crown. So one thing you can say about Brad Katona is the guy's extremely mentally tough. You, to be cut after winning the Ultimate Fighter, come back, have to go through the Ultimate Fighter and win it again to get back into the UFC. And especially beating the guys that he beat, beating Cody Gibson, beating a guy like... Um, Timor Valiev on the show. So, gotta definitely tip your hat to Brad Katona because the guy just get back in the UFC, that was a pretty awesome accomplishment. But this is a great fight right here because the way they match up, I mean, you look at Garrett Armfield in the stand up, he should give Katona a lot of issues, especially early on. I mean, he's gonna have a big reach advantage. And one thing about Garrett Armfield is the guy can box, he has really good straight punches. I would say. He is a lot faster and sharper than Brad Katona, and he's has some power, and he keeps it really clean, technical. He's accurate. He throws high volume. His last fight, he really just blew uh, Toshima Kazama off the map. He will rip the body, and he's a pretty technically sound striker. You know, with Katona, you watch his fight with Cody Gibson. He was getting lit up a lot, and he does struggle a little bit with those shots straight up the middle, but Katona, to me... He is extremely durable and tenacious. His cardio is never-ending. You know, he has an insane gas tank, so he could take damage. And when he starts to connect with his big hooks and his big counters, he has some power, and I feel like he could hurt Armfield. I don't think Armfield is as durable as Katona is. And then one thing about Armfield, it seems like he gets tired, and then you could start to grapple him. And Katona, I expect him to be on Armfield like a wet blanket in this fight. I think he's going to try to close the distance, Smash him against a cage, hold him against the fence, get him tired, take him down. And 
Garrett Arnfield maybe will be able to use his athleticism and his decent wrestling defense early on to thwart a little bit of that. But unless he can just catch Katona and knock him out, which I don't think is extremely likely, I think that he's going to get tired. Katona is going to eventually get on top of him and either be able to get the finish with the submission because we've seen Garrett Arnfield give up submissions to multiple opponents. Or I think Katona will just win another decision, which is usually Katona's MO. He's not really a big-time finisher in most of his fights. So I'm going to pick Katona. I think this fight's close, though, because I do feel like Armfield could be something special. It's just I think you got to give the respect to Katona at this point with the prediction because he's fought the much higher level of competition, and I think that's going to pay dividends here. And I think we're going to see Armfield probably get beat in the grappling realm again like we've seen him happen to him in the past. And I just need to see Armfield step up, get a significant win, like a win over Brad Katona, before I just come straight out picking him here against a guy like that I respect and is a grizzled veteran, even though I think Armfield could potentially be a very good prospect. So give me Katona in this one, and I'll predict him to win via decision. And this next fight, we got two top 10 guys at 145 in a clash of style striker versus grappler matchup. Arnold Allen, he's coming off that loss, but... No shame in that one. Really close fight with Max Holloway where he showed a really good account of himself in that one. And before that, he was on a super long winning streak. So he kind of needs to win this fight to stay in that title mix, stay in you know the top of the division talks. And Mofsar Evloev, he's one of these guys that has been undefeated his whole career. The guy's 17-0, but... He's had some key fights kind of slip away where he got matched up with Ilya Teporia at one point. Fight got canceled. I think he had another big name matchup that didn't go through. And he's beaten some got decent guys. Like, obviously, you see there would be Dan Ige. He has a win over uh, Dawoodoo, Nick Lenz. Diego Lopez is on a roll right now. But no crazy big wins where he beat like a name guy that's going to get him into that title mix. So this is the fight for Mofsar to get into that title picture and it's a it's a good matchup on paper I mean you look at Arnold Allen anytime he's fought someone that has good wrestling prowess I guess you could say outside of uh super washed up older Gilbert Melendez he's had some issues I mean even in that Nick Lentz fight he didn't get taken down in that fight but Lentz was able to hold him against a cage take his back from standing um and kind of have some moments in that fight. It was a very competitive fight. And, you know, funnily enough, his fight with Mofsar was also very competitive. But it's just, if you look at Arnold Allen, you know, he fought Mads Burnell. He got taken down a lot in that fight. He got taken down a lot in his fight with uh, Mokwan. He got, uh, I think he took a loss early in his UFC career where he was taken down and um, lost that way. So, He's just had some issues with wrestlers, and most of his wins, when you look at his winning streak outside of older guys, they've all been striking-based fighters. So Mofsar, the game plan's going to be easy for him. He's going to be shooting all day, and he's going to be trying to get the takedown, control the position, and kind of hang out on top. I don't see him trying to be a crazy submission guy. I don't see him trying to go for a big uh, ground and pound. He's going to want to control Allen and keep him on the ground because... On the feed, I think Mofsar can land. I think that Allen doesn't necessarily have the best defense, but Allen's super slick, super dangerous with his counters. And we've seen Mofsar get tired in the past too. So if Allen can show some resistance in the grappling that we haven't seen him really do in the past, he could potentially have success on the feed and he could maybe get Mofsar tired and then get him out of there later in the fight. It seems like Allen is good at that too. He's good at growing into the fight, getting better as it goes on. He has great cardio. and But I just feel like Mofsar has more ways to win. I think that he can use his wrestling to open up the striking and land on Allen, who's a little bit hittable. I think he could take him down and will control him on the ground. I don't see a finish as a likely outcome for Mofsar Evloev, but I think he's going to go out there and get the decision victory. I just can't trust Arnold Allen against a wrestler with good submission defense because I just... I don't think that Allen's going to be able to stop the takedown. His fights against grapplers has kind of not proven to me that he can do that. So I feel like 
Evlov, if he's ever having some issues on the feet, I think he can just hit the takedown, get him against the cage, control him. And I don't think Allen's going to have an answer for that ultimately. So get to go with Evlov via decision. And up next, we got a fight that I'm looking forward to, a fight that should be a banger here with Mark andre Barriol taking on Chris Curtis. Two guys that like to get inside, get in the pocket, and throw down. So it should be a war, and it should be a really fun fight. So, man, I mean, when you look at Mark andre Barriol, he's been looking pretty good recently. I mean, his fight with Julian Marquez was back and forth, but dominated Eric Anders pretty easily. He dropped him early and kind of just took over the fight from there. And he's been on a decent run. He had that one loss to Anthony Hernandez. But besides that, he's been winning most of his fights lately. Chris Curtis, he had that great start to his UFC career. Then has been kind of up and down since then. He recently hasn't gotten a win in a while. He hasn't won since 2022 because had a loss to Kelvin. And then had a fight with Nasruddin Amavov where he wasn't looking the best in that fight. He was getting held against the cage. He was getting out kind of out-hustled in that one, and then a headbutt led to that fight becoming a no contest, and that was unfortunate because you watched the fight previous with Kelvin as well, a headbutt could, you could argue, potentially led to him losing the fight on the on the scorecards, so this had been, has been having issues with that recently, so hopefully this is a clean fight, no fouls, and go out there and can get a definitive winner, but Chris Curtis, he's getting up there. He's 36 years old. So this fight is going to be a prove-it fight to me here. If he goes out there, he looks like shit in this fight. I think you could safely say that he's going to be a fade for the rest of his career because he has to perform here, man. I mean, I thought his fight with the mob off, he didn't look the greatest. And this fight is a, is a much better matchup with Mark andre Berriot. He's getting a guy that wants to get in the pocket um, Barriott is not the best defensively, you know, he kind of just shells and absorbs shots and then tries to clinch you, he tries to land that counter uh, left hook, he will mix in some kicks, but not really, I mean, both these guys really are predominantly hands, and um, I think Barriott's best path to victory in this fight is to try to push Chris Curtis against the cage, dirty box, kind of maul on him and use his size, use his cardio, and for Chris Curtis, if these guys are just boxing, I think he's going to have a pretty significant advantage. I feel like Curtis has good defense, good offense, and he can go to the body. He can open up some power shots on Barriott, and I feel like Barriott could potentially get knocked out in this fight if he can't get his grappling going. And I don't think Barriott has the wrestling to take down Curtis, who has good takedown defense. To me, Curtis should win this fight, but it's just going to come down to where is he at physically? Is he the same physically as he was when he was on that more of a winning streak in the UFC and mentally? Is he going to be able to bounce back? So I'm going with Curtis, but this is a pivotal fight. I think it's a make or break fight for his career here. I'll say he goes out there and actually gets the knockout. And this next fight, this is a tricky fight for me. I mean, I don't have a great read on this one. You guys need to help me out with this fight in the comments. Put down below who... Are you leaning towards confidently? Like, do you really feel like Malat should be a minus 300 favorite against Neil Magny? Or do you think that that line's kind of out of order? Because, man, I'm not trying to run to the betting window with Neil Magny, especially with how he looks against Ian Gary and just how he looked even in his couple fights previous to that. But I feel like he has to be the value side here against Mike Malat, right? I mean, Mike Malat... He went to the second round in his last fight, I guess, but mostly been a first-round fighter. Um, and someone that I feel like has a, a lot of question marks. Like, he has good counter-striking, um, distance control. He tries to land the pool twos, and uh, he'll throw leg kicks. Obviously, I think he's going to be looking to land leg kicks all day in this fight. But how good is his striking defense, really? How good is he if... Someone can keep walking him down, absorb damage, keep backing him up. Is he going to be able to keep the same prettiness with the striking? Or is he going to get muddied up and end up being in that clinch battle with Neil Magny? And I think if he can get on top of Magny, especially in the first round, he has a good chance to submit him. His submission game looks pretty tight. And Magny is not the greatest with the submission defense, especially recently. But 
if he can't get Magni out of there early and they start clinching and it becomes a battle of attrition, I could definitely see Neil Magni start to make it a Neil Magni type of fight and start to take over the, the matchup. I mean, I think that Magni has a decent chance here. Ultimately, I mean, I've been picking against Mike Malott in a lot of his fights. I just haven't been a believer and I've been wrong a lot. But um, so I'm going to pick him in this one. But I don't feel good about it, man. I really don't. I feel like Neil Magny is a live underdog in the spot. But I'm going to kind of begrudgingly go with Mike Malat. I'll say he wins via submission. And in the co-main event, we got the vacant Bantamweight title on the line. We're going to see who's the successor of Amanda Nunes in this division. We got Rocky Raquel Pennington taking on Myro Bueno Silva. And Rocky Pennington, she's already had one title shot before against Amanda Nunes. Had to really battle her way back to this title shot. It's been quite a few years since then. She's racked up, a, I think, a six-fight winning streak at this point. So she's been killing it. She's been doing really good. 35 years old, though, this is really going to be her final opportunity to get this belt strapped around her waist. And she has a tough opponent across from her in Myra Buena Silva, who's streaking right now, who's moved up to 135 and looked really good. She's finished all the opponents that she's fought since coming up to 135. At 125, she really didn't perform the greatest. I mean, she was kind of up and down. She had some kind of questionable fights where she lost to Marina Moroz. She had a decision uh, draw with Montana De La Rosa. So moving up to 135 seemed like it, it's definitely been the proper decision. And she's looked a lot better. Even in her last fights at 125, I feel like she looked better like when she fought Manon Firo. Even though that fight, she kind of annoyed me with her game plan in certain aspects. I think she still looked good. But getting back to this fight, this matchup... Um, yeah, it's going to be interesting. I mean, both these girls have passed to victory, if you ask me. You look at Rocky Pennington's path to victory. She, since her first title fight, I think she's gotten a lot more athletic. She's gotten faster, more mobile. And she still gets backed up a lot. Way too easy for my liking. Like, she'll put herself up against the cage. But she has a really nice jab. She has one of the best jabs in the division, I feel like. And then she also has a really nice straight right hand. So she likes to move around, try to counter punch you. And then she'll close the distance with these switch stance, kind of odd angle um, combinations. And she can land on you. I mean, it's kind of awkward, but she can get it done. She's also starting to mix in a little bit more kicks, leg kicks, body kicks, which she used to never throw kicks in the past. So that shows some good evolution in her striking game. And... Her uh, boxing defense is good. She has good boxing for the division for sure. And she also likes to obviously press you against the fence, hold you there. That's been kind of some things that people don't like about her. She can make fights boring in that way. I don't think she really has the best wrestling. I mean, some people are assuming that she's going to try to use a wrestling game plan to win this fight. And I, I don't see that happening necessarily. I mean, maybe she'll try to mix in some clinch control time like I was just talking about. But... She hasn't gotten more than one takedown in a fight in the UFC in a long time. And I think she's only done it once. And she just doesn't really have the best technique on her wrestling. I think Myra Bueno Silva has also gotten a lot better with her defensive wrestling. But for Rocky to win this fight, I think she just needs to be on her movement game. She can't get backed up. She can't let uh, Silva kick her and not return with anything and just be kind of a stationary target. And she has to be sharp with her jab and sharp with her um, counter right hand. And when she gets backed up, she needs to throw combinations to get off the cage or circle off really quickly to not be kind of in that danger zone. And for Myra Buena Silva, she's one of the most dangerous fighters in these female weight classes because she can get it done on the ground on top, off of her back. She can get it done with knockouts on the feet. She can get it done with standing submissions. So... She's live to finish you everywhere, in the clinch, on the ground, at distance. Um, she's she's just very dangerous fighter. And she, on the feet in this fight, needs to be more active. I mean, the one gripe about Myra Buenasova that I would say that really is annoying sometimes is she'll just walk girls down and not do anything. She's not throwing any punches. She's coming forward with nothing. So 
fighters can just land on her stick and move and she's just kind of like a walking uh target dummy and it's like you got to throw punches you got to come in with strikes but recently and what I think she needs to do in this fight is throw kicks man those kicks are going to be the difference maker in the fight I think she could really have a lot of success with that the front kicks to the body the leg kicks if she's active with her kicks controls the distance well and doesn't just close that gap with nothing there where Rocky can land the counter punch and get out of the way. She should be able to really tear apart Rocky with the kicks. And then when Myra gets into the fight, gets aggressive and starts letting her hands go, she has some real power. So I think she could hurt Rocky and kind of make Rocky a little bit less willing to sit down and really land those counter strikes. And if she starts to land leg kicks, then I think it could take away a lot of the movement from Rocky as well. And one area where I think that Myra Bueno Silva is going to be able to kind of take away from Rocky Pennington that other fighters haven't been able to, and I don't think Rocky's going to want to go to this at all, is really a lot of clinching because I think Myra Bueno Silva is nasty in the clinch with her knees, with her elbows. She stays active, and I think she'll tear, up, tear Rocky apart in the clinch. I think she's going to be able to have a lot of success in that area. If they're clinched up, I feel like Myra's going to do more of the damage. Elbows are also going to be there, and I don't think that Rocky's even going to be able to hit the takedowns. If she does, Silva could get tired, or Silva could get the submission. It's kind of a 50-50 proposition that would be taking a risk with Rocky where, hey, I could go this route, I could get a takedown or two and win the fight by breaking my Bueno Silva, gassing her out, or I could get caught in a front choke, I could get caught in an arm bar, and I... I just don't think that Rocky has the wrestling to want to go that route and be confident in it. So I think it's going to be more of a stand-up fight. And I think that Myra's a dog. I feel like she could really dig down deep and uh, make it a war. And we saw already in Rocky's first fight for the title that she has a little bit of quit in her. And I feel like in this one, because of that, she's going to be really tough and want to stick in there and go the full distance. So I think she's going to be hard to finish. But... I just feel like if this becomes a dog fight, that Myra's going to dig down a little deeper. And I also kind of feel like Rocky Pennington, she's been a little bit of a ball dropper in the big moments. Like when she's fought uh, UFC champions, I think she's lost all those fights. And this obviously isn't a UFC champion across from her and Myra Benesova yet, but it's a UFC title fight. It's a huge um, matchup in terms of just uh, where they are on the card and what it's going to be for the future of their careers. So I could see, you know, um, Jessica Andrade kind of dropping the ball a little bit. I mean, you look at her career, she has, she did, I guess she did beat Jessica Andrade once, but she also lost to Andrade. She lost to Holly Holm twice. She lost to Amanda Nunes. She lost to uh, Jermaine Durandamy. So it seems like when she gets in these big spots, she sometimes doesn't perform. So I'm going to go with Myra Buenosova, and I'm going to go with her to win this one via decision. I feel like she's going to be maybe in a tough fight early where Rocky could win uh, maybe a round, maybe two of the first three rounds. But I think ultimately Myra's going to do the damage with the kicks. And I think at the end of the fight when they're both tired and they got to dig down deep and someone has to really come away and show the judges something to give them to win the fight I think it'll be Silva so give me Myra Buena Silva here to win in a good fight competitive fight via decision and then finally we got the main event we got Sean Strickland defending his title for the first time against Drikas Duplessis and this fight's kind of gotten added up a notch I mean I actually didn't really think Drikas had that in him to talk shit like that before that press conference but he really got under Sean's, Sean's skin so it's made the build up for this fight that much more fun and it's made uh the anticipation for this fight that much higher so hopefully no one gets stabbed hopefully we we get to the fight but man i mean this is amazing clash styles to me i mean sean strickland we already know his resume he came in short notice took out izzy dominated him has really looked awesome since he's came back from that motorcycle accident only had the loss to Pereira and the controversial loss to Cannoneer and just phenomenal boxing really good defense and then Drikas the guy has been undefeated since coming to the UFC he just beat Robert Whitaker which if you're not Israel Adesanya 
no one's really been able to do in recent years and it automatically gets you a title shot pretty much and even though it initially he didn't get the title shot he's getting his rightful title shot now so matchup wise I mean Drake is athletic explosive beast with power he has kind of some tricky attacks you look at Duplessis to me as a weird style overall he looks awkward he looks a little clunky but he makes it work for him I mean he's consistently switching stances he explodes in with big wild hooks he seems like he really overextends but he likes to throw switch dance blitz attacks they can be kind of awkward and difficult to see coming so they can land and in terms of his hands in this fight I think the left hook is going to be the strike he's going to be looking to land I think it's going to be the strike he should finish his uh, hand combinations with and could be effective. And I think he's going to be more effective landing kicks than punches in this fight, though. I think he's going to land uh, leg kicks potentially, but Strickland really showed superb leg kick defense in his last fight, so I think that could be hard. But I think Duplessis' body kicks could be open versus Sean. Sean can eat body kicks, and Drikas Duplessis' body kicks are super hard, so... Spamming the body kick could be something du Duplessis tries to do in this fight. Defensively, Drikas really relies heavily on his chin, his ability to absorb damage. He will also shell up, use a high guard to kind of take shots, come back with counter hooks. And he's in his physical prime right now, so he can use that style until his chin starts to wane on him. And in this fight, he's not facing a big puncher, so it's probably not going to be a worry for him to try to do that. And Duplessis should definitely look to get this fight to the ground. To me, he kind of has questionable wrestling ability because he could struggle to close that gap and shoot on guys. He's a little bit clunky, but he's very physical, so he could hit takedowns when he could time them well. And on top, he's a beast. He has super heavy top pressure, hard ground and pound. He has a good submission game, good front chokes. Takedown defense hasn't been great in the UFC. He only has a 40% takedown defense rate, but... Hard to hold down, especially against the fence. And it's doubtful that he's even going to have to worry about that against Sean. Cardio-wise, Drikas does push a pace. But he's gotten tired in multiple fights in the UFC. And that's going to be something to monitor in this fight. Because it's five rounds and Strickland is a very good cardio fighter. So if Drikas gets tired, that could pay uh, be a difference in the fight. But Sean Strickland, he's primarily a boxer. He... We'll throw some leg kicks, head kicks in there, but it's mostly all hands. And he likes to pressure, stay in your face. He has one of the best jabs, one twos in the UFC. He's incredibly difficult to hit, too. I mean, he just walks guys down, uses the jab, one twos, uh, slips, parries, rolls with shots. He's always checking and parrying the kicks. And he can completely nullify fighters, get them tired, and just beat them up. And he should look to take advantage of Drikas' defensive tendencies. I mean, Drikas. Likes to use a high shell guard. And if he can kind of fake up top and rip the body, that should be effective. I think he could land some body shots. And if he can land a lot of body shots early, that could get Drikas a little bit tired, get him to drop his hands. So then Sean could start to tee off on him to the head. But right now, Drikas is a juggernaut. I mean, so he almost lets guys um, hit him. He leaves his chin out so fighters will engage and then tries to knock him out with the counter. So Sean just has to be smart. He has to not be emotional, fight defensively sound like he usually always does. And he just has to be perfect almost in this fight. He can't let Drikas hit him clean. Drikas hits too hard to be kind of playing that game. And we've seen multiple fights where Drikas is losing, but only needed one punch to change the direction of the fight and end up winning via knockout. And Strickland is the better striker to me, though, overall. I mean, he's more fluid. He's way better defensively. His punching technique is better. Um, you know, just a little bit less clunky and just the better striker, in my opinion. And he's a highly regarded grappler, Sean Strickland, but we rarely see it in his fights. When you hear fighters who train with Sean talk about his wrestling and grappling, they say it's great. I, you know, I've heard he out-wrestles Magomed and Kalaev and... For this camp, he has Johnny Eblen, an elite wrestler training with him, which should help a lot. But we don't really see um, his wrestling or his get-ups in fights too much. So it's hard to be that confident in Strickland if he does get put on his back just because we haven't seen it in a long time. But I think Drikas' best path to victory is to 
try to get it to the ground, uses top pressure strength advantage. So Sean just has to be aware that wrestling is likely going to be a big part of Drikus' game plan. And Sean Strickland's cardio is a weapon, so if he can extend this fight to the later rounds, he should be the fresher fighter. Way more five-round fights for Sean than Drikus has had. And ultimately, I'm going to go with Sean Strickland as my prediction here. I think he's going to be able to win a decision or win in the later rounds via TKO. I just believe that Drikus, he... If he doesn't get the knockout or the finish, if he can't get the takedown, which I think it's going to be more of a stand-up fight, honestly, then I think Shad's going to win. It, having to rely on a knockout in a high-level fight against someone that's extremely difficult to hit, in that scenario, I kind of have to lean towards Sean Strickland. So Sean Strickland is going to be the prediction for me, and I'm going to predict him to win this fight via decision. So thanks for watching this video, guys. Like I said at the beginning of the video, hit the like button, man. Let's try to get as many likes as possible, 500 likes, 1,000 likes. I mean, as many people that are watching this video, they can hit the like button. It's free. It's easy. Really helps out the channel. And uh, put a comment down below. Let's uh, get some engagement in this video. Tell me what you think of my predictions. Do you agree? Do you disagree? And besides that, for my most confident pick on this card, um, that one's kind of a difficult one. I don't think there's a lot of, like, super easy um, – Fights on this card, I think there's a lot of close matchups. So, ultimately, um, for my most confident pick, I'm trying to think right now what I would say. Um, it's hard. I guess I would go with um, Jazuda Vicious, but I just don't have a lot of confidence on her at that price tag. But for the play of the week, I would go with Suri CD, minus 175. I think that he should be able to go out, go out there and get the job done again. So... Money line value wise, I feel like he is giving me my play of the week this week. Not going to do a parlay of the week. So, thanks for watching, guys. Hopefully, you enjoyed this video. Hit that like button. Go to Patreon. Sign up. Um, get some free picks for this month. A lot of fight cards going down this week. There's like five or six different fight cards already. I already got a bet for KSW. So, I'll talk to you guys later. And thanks for watching this video.